A good day to all of you. Joining here today at uh, Across the Green Table is a renowned Sri Lankan who has brought so much of fame and pride to the island nation, especially with the knowledge that he has learned. Guess what? He's the name of many species of animals such as fish, medians, spiders, bats, etc. included in the inventions of the world. A team led by Professor S.D. Biju of the University of Delhi has named a species of animals consisting of eight species of tree frogs found in Asia and Africa as Rohan Alexis in the honor of none other than Dr. Rohan Pithyaguda. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much, Dusram. So today we are going to talk about biodiversity of Sri Lanka. What is so unique about biodiversity of Sri Lanka and what is the reason behind we as a nation and as a government should protect it? I think Sri Lanka is uh, special, especially because of the southwest of the island. This remarkable region we refer to as having a perhumid climate. This word perhumid is something that people don't hear very often. But Sri Lanka's wet zone is unique there's nothing like it. There's no climate like it between West Africa and Sumatra in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand with a climate like the southwest of Sri Lanka between Ambagamua and Mathura and west thereof, this southwestern quarter. The thing there is that the rainfall is not only high. There are many places that have higher rainfall in Asia but there's no dry months. We have this perpetual wetness. Every month receives pretty much 100 millimeters of rain at least. And that means that it can support these so-called mixed dip dipterocarp forests, which support incredibly high biodiversity, frogs, reptiles, and so on. Mm. And this makes Sri Lanka very special. And the fact that we've been isolated from India for so long means that Endemism is very high in this region as well. So we as a nation, yes, as you said, uh, obviously there's a reason behind why we should protect it. But is it only enough, we as a nation, to act all like Should we as a region look after the biodiversity? No, I think it's our responsibility. We have a sovereign responsibility mm -hmm. to look after biodiversity, to conserve it, and to maximize its value, its utility to our people. Uh, we can't look to the world to do this on our behalf. Correct. It's fundamentally our responsibility. The Constitution makes it our responsibility. And that's why institutions like the Department of Wildlife Conservation are so important to give meaning to the fact that we have a duty to pass this biodiversity on to future generations, not just our children and grandchildren, but in perpetuity. Because evolution is a process that works in the periods of thousands of years. We can't just think of this year and next year. This is a long-term commitment. Okay, now Sri Lanka is considered one of the uh, 34 biodiversity hotspots identified by the world and uh, has the highest biodiversity per unit area of the land amongst all the Asian countries. Now, if we talk about the rich variety of biodiversity and the ecosystems from rainforest to coral reefs, can you provide us with an overview of what sort of uh, this biodiversity experience that we can offer to the world. Sure. So let's start with the word hotspot that you used. Hotspot means that we must have uh, a certain minimum number of flowering plants that are endemic to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has about a thousand species of flowering plants or vascular plants that are endemic to the, the island. Thousand. About a thousand. But we are considered a hotspot in combination with the Western Ghats of India. We are one biological region. But there's a bad side to this as well, that our natural habitats have to have been eroded 
to a certain minimum level. Mm -hmm. We've lost about 70% of natural habitat in Sri Lanka. That's what really makes us a hotspot. So there's a good part, high biodiversity. On the other hand, low habitat. That's the qualification. So it's not all good. How much biodiversity do we have? First of all, we need to remember that biodiversity is not just species. It includes habitats, ecosystems, landscapes. There's much more to biodiversity than just species. As far as species are concerned, which is what most people think about, we're pretty good. We've got almost 235 species of birds resident in Sri Lanka, 34 which, of which are not seen anywhere else in the world. 120 species of frogs, of which 90% are endemic to Sri Lanka. Okay. 51 species of freshwater crabs, all of which are endemic to Sri Lanka. And the same is true for most groups of animals. These are only the founded numbers. Yes. And we've got many more to find because exploration is going on in almost every year new species are described. This is a continuing process of exploration. And so this, this rich biodiversity exists on the one hand. On the other, we have institutions like the Department of Wildlife Conservation and the Forest Department whose job it is to protect those species by preventing people from harming them. But there's very little we do by way of actual conservation. Hmm. Conservation involves the scientific study of these species, their ecosystems, the landscapes they occupy, and inventing scientific management plans and implementing those plans to make sure that those species, especially the threatened species, don't decline in number. Okay. And this is a huge ask. So, I just wanted to touch on uh, what are the threats to the uh, biodiversity in Sri Lanka? So, if you say so, like, and if you take the efforts and the challenges are there are any like rules and regulations in place to address these? Yes, the laws are there to address them. But the problem is we have to think about the reality. Okay. The reality is that... What are the major threats? People. There's only one threat to biodiversity in the whole world. That is people. Right. So how do we manage the impact of people on biodiversity? That is really the only challenge that there is to consider. So we have to remember that since... We had independence 75 years ago. Our population has gone up by three times. We now have an average of 330 people living in Sri Lanka per square kilometer. In the wet zone of Sri Lanka, it's more than double that. Mm. And the wet zone is where, as I already discussed, biodiversity is richest. So the richest area for biodiversity is also the area that has got the highest human population density. And here in the wet zone, just 5% of natural habitats are conserved. So we've got this huge wealth of biodiversity in the wet zone that is focused, that is concentrated in just 5% of the habitat. Right. Uh, so if you take uh, Sri Lanka's uh, this ecosystem and the biodiversity, we have a very high variety of endemism, like where the uh, many species found nowhere else in the world. If you can come up with some of the examples, uh, like unique species, and uh, if you can talk further about how we can conserve them. So there are many species that are known from just one or two places, which are quite rare. There's a frog, a tree frog called Pseudophilautus stellatus. It was first discovered in 1860 or thereabouts, never seen again. And finally... Never a, seen? Again. Oh, really? Okay. Right? It was described... It was such a vivid description, a green frog with gold spots on it. You can't miss that. We looked for it everywhere, never found it, until finally around 2013, after a gap of more than a century and a half, Mr. Mendis Vikramasinghe succeeded in finding a specimen on top of a tree in the peak wilderness. It's still one of Sri Lanka's rarest frogs. Okay. I have not seen one, but many of my colleagues have now trudged up to the peak wilderness to see this. How do we conserve this? We have no idea how it breeds. We have no idea how it finds a mate. We don't know what it's called, its vocalization is. We don't know what kind of habitat it occupies, what it eats. So to conserve the species, we have to learn all this. And that's a massive amount of work. I'll give you another example. In Peridhania Gardens, right behind the herbarium is a big ficus tree, Nugagaha. Very prominent. It's the only one of its kind in Sri Lanka. Nowhere else in the country. These are prominent trees and if there were more, we would have found them by now. And we have no idea how to make this tree propagate. 
propagating figs is complicated. Okay. Because they have a pollination method that depends on a kind of wasp that is unique to that tree. Every species of fig has a unique species of wasp as its pollinator. Okay. If the wasp goes because you sprayed insecticide, you lose the fig. There's nothing to pollinate it after that. Mm. But we have to study these and find out how can we save the species by doing the science that is involved. So who is responsible? Nobody. That is the catch. So <laughs> everyone who does this is doing it as a volunteer, as an amateur, or as a university scientist or student who is doing it through, purely through self-interest. There's no institution. We don't have a National Institute of Biodiversity Research. We should, but we don't. And that kind of institutional framework would be the solution to the problem. But until that day comes, we, uh, we have to manage the best we can. Uh, how do you see the traditional knowledge and this indigenous knowledge that everyone talks about, like uh, contribute towards conservation biodiversity? And you always talk about values and ethics, you know, when it comes to bio the conservation part, the efforts. If you can comment further on it. Well, our traditional knowledge on biodiversity obviously was quite good. There, there were names for pretty much every species. When, when Sri Lankan biodiversity first came to be explored a long time ago in the Dutch period, in the 1680s by a man called Dr. Paul Hermann, who was a Dutch physician living near Colombo. He made the first herbarium of Sri Lankan plants. Sri Lankan botany has a very ancient history in the world of botany. We are one of the earliest countries to have not just one, but three books were published on, on the plants of Sri Lanka before 1747, mm -hmm. right? A long time ago, people were working on this flora. So this, this, this discovery showed that Sri Lankans had names for all these plants. Every plant in the forest pretty much has a name. Okay. That means people are aware, aware of it and they had a use for it because if you don't have a use for something, you won't bother to name it. Why would you, why would you bother? Correct. But then on the other hand, you need to remember that our population at that time was less than 2 million people. So our, our footprint on the land was very small. So you can't do much harm. So traditional methods of conservation, though they undoubtedly existed, didn't have to be very sophisticated because they were not dealing with a serious problem, because there weren't enough people to cause a serious problem. So if you look at the dry zone of Sri Lanka, which is where shifting cultivation, so-called chena cultivation, has been taking place for thousands of years. Okay. People would cut down the forest, burn it, plant some crops and move on. But they did this maybe once every 20 or 30 years, so there was enough time for the forest to grow again. But if you've got everyone doing that, obviously you're going to lose all your forest. At the same time, thanks to modern agriculture, which has helped us, since independence, our production of rice has gone up like incompar incomparably. Um, at the time we got independence, we were producing about 1.8 tons of rice per hectare. Now we're doing almost five tons of rice per hectare. Otherwise, you'd have used a lot more land, but still, Three quarters of a million hectares of Sri Lankan land is dedicated to rice. Now, I'm going to take a minute to tell you an additional problem that comes from that. Elephants, Asian elephants in other parts of Asia, which are heavily forested, are not very many. In heavy forests, they don't have the resource they want most, mm. which is a dense growth of nutritious grass. Correct. Now, humans have planted a dense growth of nutritious grass by the way of paddy on three quarters of a million hectares of Sri Lanka. Yeah. Elephant heaven. The second thing that elephants want is water. Every time you see elephants in the evening, if you go anywhere to main area to watch them, they're in the water. And we've created 10,000 village tanks in Sri Lanka. Again, perfect habitat for elephants. So elephant population has grown immeasurably. This brings them into conflict with humans. So we have a conservation problem, again, that is man-made, not intentionally, but it's a byproduct of the success of humans. And dealing with that calls for sophisticated science. Now, uh, as you uh, came up the topic elephants, and you know, recently uh, with this candy procession, uh, everyone started again talking about, you know, elephants being kept uh, not in their natural habitat, but being used for human purpose. Your comment on that? So you have to balance tradition <clears throat> with reality. So whose call is that? It's a call of the citizens because the values of our citizens comes from their own system of heritage and, and their values. Let me take a more difficult example. People say it's bad to eat wildlife. We don't like poaching. 
if you see venison for sale, this is illegal, you can go to prison. Because we don't believe that a civilized society should be harvesting meat from the wild. We should be farming it. Mm. But then we harvest tens of thousands of tons of fish from the ocean, which is wildlife, and nobody seems to think that that's a moral problem. So a lot of these issues, even when it comes to elephants, taking an animal from the wild, to me, I see very little difference from taking an elephant from the wild and taking a fish from the wild. But that is me talking strictly as a scientist. Okay. But as a citizen, people would have very different attitudes to that. And I respect that. I respect that. So the thing is, our values dictate how we respond to these problems. There is no black and white here. Hmm. It, it all depends on the context. And if elephants can be maintained in a, as tame or domestic elephants, domesticated elephants that serve a cultural function in a way that is humane, I see nothing wrong with it. You can't see anything wrong with it in a world that still eats millions of tons of wild animals every year. So, uh, but these tamed elephants can be found only in the Asian region, right? Or you, do you get uh, tamed elephants anywhere else? Well, in African elephants can have been tamed, but they're not as docile as Asian elephants. When the Asian elephant was first described in uh, 1758 mm. by Linnaeus, one of the characteristics was docilis in Latin, docile. It is, it is a very benign animal, right. and so it's easy to train. So, coming back uh, to Sri Lanka's biodiversity and ecosystems, the protected areas also play a, quite a pivotal role in the uh, biodiversity conservation. Can you elaborate on the challenges and the success of managing them and expanding these areas? Or, or is there a possibility that we can further like, go beyond of uh, what is identified at the moment and expanding? You can't really do that. So, this is a commitment that government has made by 2030 to start expanding forests in Sri Lanka. You can expand forests, but not in a way that matters to biodiversity, unfortunately. Most of Sri Lanka's protected areas are in the dry zone, which contains the least amount of endemism. It's very low endemism. The great richness lies in the wet zone. Hmm. But the wet zone's protected areas, if you think about it, Horton Plains, Singaraja, Kannelia, Kottava, Nakedanya, Heniduma, all little patches of forest in a huge landscape of people. And these are isolated. Joining them up is a massive challenge because of the human population density that occupies the ocean between these islands. And so, in the long term, we can think that maybe national prosperity will help us to solve part of this problem. How will that be done? Assume that Sri Lankans from their present per capita GDP or what, $9,000 a year, that we made that $40,000 a year. What does that mean? It means that people are working in cities, not farming cash crops in the village. So as the country advances economically, people tend to move into cities and abandon farmland and land in rural areas. Then we will have an opportunity to convert this land back into forest. But until that happens, we don't stand a chance. So economic development is the biggest priority. And that's why I always argue with my environmental colleagues, mm. don't stifle the economy. The thing we need most is rapid development. Poverty is the greatest enemy of the environment. Poverty? Yes. So Poor people will have no interest in environment. You have to enrich really people. You have to enrich people. And that's when they start paying attention to the environment. It is prosperity that means environment is looked after. That's how the countries in the West are doing it. It's only after they became prosperous that they started cleaning up the environment. Britain brought in a clean air system regulations only in the 1950s. Until then, they were having smog and people were dying of smog mm. until the 1950s. But once you're rich enough to care, you clean up. Right. And the next thing, as you brought again, uh, the Britain example, uh, uh, the climate change. The climate change is also impacting uh, greatly on the biodiversity and uh, Sri Lanka is no different, of course. What adoption and the mitigation uh, strategies are in place, especially uh, to safeguard biodiversity through climate change? Nothing. So, we can't do this. We have to be conscious of that fact. Uh, so, what does climate change mean? In the past century and a half, 
temperatures on average in Sri Lanka have gone up by about 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm. Uh, rainfall in the highlands in Norelia has come down by about 20 percent. That's quite a lot. Rainfall patterns are changing. The first inter intermonsoon is shortening and we are getting more rain in short bursts like we are experiencing right now in the wet zone. So dry periods will become longer. That means stress for the forest. But there is nothing we can do about that. As far as biodiversity is concerned, we are pretty helpless. The problem is just too big. In the next century, sea level might go up by a meter. That means that many parts of the lowlands will have some flooding. But remember, just six, five or 6,000 years ago, sea level went up by more than a meter. That's why you find in areas like Hikaru inland, if you dig down to dig a well, you find coral. All oh, right. Right, because th those were coral reefs at mm. that time. So we have to accept that climate change will happen, hope that we develop fast enough to have the wealth to mitigate it. Remember, Colombo Port City is a model climate change uh, example. It means reclaiming land from the sea. Correct. If you look at Schiphol Airport in Holland, in, in the Netherlands, one of the biggest airports in Europe, it is built below sea level. It is technology, it is innovation that's going to help us to overcome climate change. It's not building resilience, but resilience is relevant to agriculture, not to wildlife. To agriculture, for example, for the tea industry, climate change is entailing a big difference. When we were children, we learned that Watavala was the wettest place in Sri Lanka. You probably yeah, learned yeah, that in school. Yeah. I don't think that's any longer true. <laughs> now the wettest area has moved down to Ratnapura, Moravaka, Deniaya, that area. Mm, okay. You see? So as that changes, we have to think about how agriculture is going to change. As temperature increases, we have to think what is the future of the tea industry. Above 34 degrees Celsius, tea becomes pretty useless. So how do we mitigate that effect? We grow tea under shade. Okay. Right. So you how about the uh, tea from like uh, southern part of... That's right. So you have to keep that cool and the way to keep it cool is to shade it. So you have maybe mixed cropping of tea, not just tea. large tea fields, but you have mixed and intercrop tea. And that way you can maybe continue the tea industry. But if we have industrialization that is rapid enough, who needs tea? Look at Japan. I mean, Japan's tea industry has shrunk to just a tiny amount because the country has industrialized. And then you just grow a little tea, which you sell at some crazy expensive price, just because people want to drink salon tea and will pay anything for it. Right. And other thing, uh, Dr. Vithyagada, is about uh, human-wildlife conflict. And it is also quite a pressing issue here in Sri Lanka. What measures are being taken to address this particular conflict while ensuring the protection of both human and wildlife? What are the, What is the way forward for this? So, two things. First, I have to correct you. I'm Mr. Pethiagoda. I'm not Dr. Pethiagoda. <laughs> okay. Right. I, I have no pretensions to this. What is important to recognize about conflict between humans and wildlife is that all casualties from wildlife, as far as humans are concerned, are in effect accidental deaths. Hmm. Right. Just think of it in the context of accidental death. Because if an elephant attacks a farm, and a farmer gets hurt or killed, terrible thing, I accept that, but it's an accidental death. Well, more if, than 150 of such incidents had taken place of the recent past. But per year. Per year. But don't forget, in the same time, per year, 300 people die of snake bite. Who pays any attention to that? <laughs> 800 people die of drowning last year. Who paid much attention to that? 2,500 people died from motor car accidents. You have to look at these things in context. Mm. Elephant-induced accidental deaths. Every death is a tragedy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be flippant about this. Okay. But I think we have to be realistic also. Elephants cause less than 5% of the accidental deaths in Sri Lanka. We need to pay attention to accidental death as a phenomenon of its own. The elephants get a lot of attention, especially because they make excellent television. When, elephant raids, when an elephant raids a farm, or elephant gets killed, super. Evening news makes it. Somebody gets bitten by a snake and dies, it never makes the news. Okay, so, as I ask, like, you know, what are, what are the way forward, the mechanisms uh, in protection of both then? So, let's look at elephants. The short answer is there are so many people in Sri Lanka 
And Sri Lanka is so dependent on agriculture. And the agriculture model we followed, even from the time of Mahavali, from the time of independence or before, has been a peasant agriculture. Small holdings, cash crops, or small holdings of rice. Mm. Poor people. Basically, the people who are creating food for us are the poorest in the country. But they perform an invaluable service. How do you protect these people? Traditionally, we've looked at electric fences as being the main stay for protecting them. We have more than 4,500 kilometers of electric fence in Sri Lanka. That's enough to run an electric fence around Sri Lanka's coastline three and a half times, <laughs> right around the country. <laughs> but still, last year, 450 elephants dead, almost 150 people dead, despite all that. Okay. So there is no real choice but to face the fact that we have to coexist. How do we coexist? How, do, how does farming live in a landscape filled with elephants? The only way you can do this is to protect the farms. Our traditional approach has been to try to keep elephants in protected areas, in national parks, for example. But this is very difficult to do because 70% of the elephants that raid farms are male elephants. They are the boys are the, that are troublesome, just like humans. 95% of the convicts in Valikata prison are men. <laughs> elephants are very little different. Most of the troublesome ones are males. Right. The females usually remain with the calves and the other females in a more forest-like environment. Mm. The males are very good at getting around electric fences. Sometimes they swim out to sea to go around the fence, like in Yala. Other times they'll topple a tree onto the fence. Otherwise, there's a power so cut. So they're intelligent enough for doing so. They're, they're very clever animals. If you've seen elephants performing in the zoo, you know they can do anything. So, so this is a difficult problem to to deal with. But the problem is, government can't tell the people that honestly because people say do something, and government has to do something. So we build fences, we give flashbangs. Sometimes we give shotguns to villagers and say defend yourselves. Government has to do something. Yeah, so we'll talk about, uh, we'll discuss about the role of the government, the regulations and the policies. What is your comment on that? I think it's excellent. I mean, government has done pretty much what it has to do. I think the big vacancy we have in government policy is integrating government policy with science. And this brings me back to the issue I mentioned earlier, that Sri Lanka has no institution for biodiversity science. This is not expensive. But isn't it vested with the Department of Wildlife Conservation? No, you can't expect wildlife conservation to do it. In other countries, this isn't a wildlife conservation job. You can do it, for example, through institutions like the, we've got the Tea Research Institute, the Medical Research Institute. We need a wildlife research institute. India has got, for example, two or three such institutions. Sri Lanka missed a wonderful example. I'm sad to say, tell you about this in 2004. We were offered by the international community $22 million mm. to set up a National Institute of Biodiversity. Okay. Right? This was in? When Chandrika Kumarathunga was president and right. Nanay Vikram Singh was prime minister. Okay. They were like cat and dog, not getting on with each other. But on this issue, both of them agreed right. and said, we need this institution. Okay. Who objected? The environmental NGOs said that this will be a, a conduit for biopiracy from Sri Lanka. And they stopped it. So, we, what happened to the money? It went to Bangalore to make an institution called ATRI, and today there are more than 50 PhD biodiversity scientists working at ATRI on Indian biodiversity problems. Sri Lanka lost a golden opportunity, very sadly. Okay. And, and so, unfortunately, the pendulum of international attention has now swung away. At that time, in 2001, shortly after the LTT attack on the airport, the world's attention was on helping Sri Lanka. Now the world's attention is on helping other places, Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine. We've, we've lost the focus of international attention. And I don't think it's going to come here in a hurry again. Right. Mr. Pithyagoda, would like to know the role of, now we talked about the role of the government, the regulations and the policies that should be in place and the improvements that should be taken place. How do you see the role of the local people especially the indigenous ones, in this con efforts of conser conserving the biodiversity and the ecosystem here in Sri Lanka? Conservation, at the end of the day, is in the hands of the people, not of the government. The people are the ones living in the landscape. The Got government it. lives in the cities and they make the laws. It's up mm -hmm. to people to follow those laws and principles. 
my own experience is people will do things like hunting bushmeat animals for protein because protein is now expensive and you will see a certain amount of poaching going on this is not a good thing because they poach everything it's maybe all right to poach a deer in terms of the population of deer being all right it may not be so good to poach other animals that are like leopards which might be more difficult to restore should the populations crash mm. but of course poaching is bad but it's inevitable when people are poor they have no other source of protein mm. well they do have sources of protein like fish in in the tank system but let's let's assume that that's happening having put that to one side sri lankan people in the villages are incredibly conscious of the need for conservation they are aware very aware take an example there is a, a rare fish i discovered around 1989 called the bandula bab in a village called galapita mada in the kegol district mm. this is in a little stream that flows through a village the fish occurs only in about 1 km that's the worldwide range of this fish is 1 km per strain a stream that flows past galapita mada okay. once the village people were told as a result of my early visits to the village you've got something really unusual in your stream okay they took a serious interest about protecting it aquarium fish collectors what made you visit that place i heard that there was a fish like this somebody right. told me a man called ranjit bandula that's why i named it the bandula bab ah okay ranjit bandula told me there's a really unusual fish and i wonder what it is because he wasn't a fish expert okay so i went and had a look and asked the village people and i caught a few fish and then i examined them and found it's a new species and oh. described the species then i went back to the village and told them here's your species and you know they were very excited by by this i visited the village three or four times okay. this was at the height of the jvp insurgency in the late 89. late 1980s yeah mm. so it was a scary time um but now the village is completely investing in invested in protecting this fish they oh, won't okay. let anyone go there and catch it even if a scientist goes no you you better come with somebody from the wildlife department if you want to look at the fish right they will not let you mess with the fish they take a really serious proprietary interest similarly there's another fish again one that i described mm. i'm not trying to pat myself on the back here it's just a coincidence at kitulgara called the asoka bab asoka petia there again a beautiful fish the local people now are educated to know that this is unique to their locality mm. and they protect the fish so this particular fish was found in which time age? about the same time 1989 ah okay right that was when i was doing most of my field work okay now i'm a little too old for that <laughs> so but now even if you go past kitulgal and now you see little boats asokopetia for tourists to come and have a look in the water all right um and you can put a snorkel and mask and look at this it's a beautiful right. fish okay. it's a beautiful okay. fish and but no one's allowed to catch it if you go there with a the net and try to catch the fish you'll have the whole village screaming down your back <laughs> so people do take an interest in conserving biodiversity i think you have to trust the people unfortunately we don't have a legislative process that invests people with rights and obligations they only have duties to obey the law so in other words our law is mainly punitive it is to dissuade people from doing what is wrong not to encourage people to do what is right so what are the like educational and the awareness programs that can be carried out especially now you mentioned that two villages looking after their own uh, hot spots so likewise you know what are the efforts that the authorities can take in order to carry out all this educational and awareness programs so the, i think the biggest thing the authorities can do is try to mobilize people in certain directions let me give you an example Sri Lanka derives about 40% of its electricity from hydropower. Right? This electricity is worth about 300 million dollars a year. Hmm. Okay? The budget of the wildlife department is about 3 million dollars a year. Hmm. 1% of the value of the hydroelectricity that comes from this energy source that we get from nature, correct? From the ecosystem. Right? If you were to tell Sri Lankan consumers please pay 1% more on your electricity bill 1% not a lot we can double the budget for conservation mm. i think they will do it and then how can you use that money how do you conserve your hydroelectricity resource 
by reforesting river margins so that you reduce the amount of silt going into your reservoirs, for example. We can make habitat level, landscape level changes that help biodiversity merely by investing more. And I think people will invest if you tell them how little it actually costs. All right. And other main thing I wanted to ask from you is that about uh, invasive uh, species so who are in fact actually have the potential of uh, disrupting uh, the uh, native ecosystems. What is Sri Lanka's position when it comes to invasive species? Do we have any examples of such? Yes, we have many. On the plants, people like Professor Buddhi Marabe have been working for a long time to build awareness and mm. build control mechanisms for invasive species. For animals, we have relatively few examples except when it comes to fish. We have about 30 species of invasive fishes, but I let's call them exotic fishes. I won't call them invasive fishes because an invasive species becomes a problem only when it invades a natural ecosystem. Yeah. All right. So you get these species that we think of as invasive on Horton Plains, for example, like Ulex, this yellow flowered thorny shrub. That yeah the Brits brought from Scotland as a garden plant and mm. now it's taken root there. But I don't consider that truly invasive because you don't find it in the forest. So most plants that are invasive grow in direct sunlight, not in a, the shade of the forest canopy. Oh, okay. It's when you get an invasive species growing in the shade of the forest canopy that you need to get activated. So uh, also in the case of fish, We've got about 30 odd species of alien fishes, which we consider invasive. But these species are not living in rainforest streams. They're living in places like Bolgoda Lake, in the reservoirs, in the lower regions of large rivers. You don't find them in the places where all the endemic and threatened fish are, hmm. the Sri Lankan ones. So at, at the moment, they haven't led to the extinction of any Sri Lankan species except perhaps the one that we find in Horton Plains, the rainbow trout, which was introduced by the British in around 1880. We know that as it about as at about 1860, there were two species of fish in the Sri Lankan highlands. A man called Edward Frederick Kellart, a, a Dutch descent doctor, a burger doctor, hmm. went and reported on this. And he collected specimens and sent them to Calcutta for identification. So we know what the fish were. Ah, okay. But after the trout were introduced in the 1880s, they disappeared. So now we have no other species of native fishes anywhere where there were trout. They've, they've gone. Oh, right. okay. So at least two were lost. But still, the irony, the paradox, is that we are protecting trout in Horton Plains, a pristine ecosystem. Okay. Right. And other other main thing I wanted to ask from you, especially about uh, the marine biodiversity and how unique it is in Sri Lanka and especially the life from like coral reefs to the other marine uh, life and uh, can you discuss the current state of the uh, marine biodiversity? So let's look at it in separate elements. The whales are the element of biodiversity in the ocean environment that most people pay attention to and the, the ban of whaling internationally has meant that there's been a large growth in whale populations and we're seeing that represented in, in Sri Lankan waters, mm. which is wonderful. Okay. But whales are in trouble because shipping goes right past southern Sri Lanka near Merissa across the area where the whales live. And to divert that shipping away from Sri Lanka is expensive because ships will then resist calling in Sri Lanka or using our services. We are, right. we are going to dissuade them from coming here. And so this is an economic problem that we've got to grapple with. So one of the threats to the uh, marine biodiversity as well. Yes, because the ships hit whales and kill whales. Yes. No doubt about that. But finding a solution is something, is a work in progress. People are thinking about that. Coral reefs are the other area that people think about, but our coral reefs are pretty much decimated and gone. That's the bad news. So compared... What was the reason behind it? It is uh, using bottom nets for trawling. Right. Okay. Because when you when you keep dragging nets through coral reef, you keep breaking the corals and it, mm. it goes off. That's the bad news. The good news is that the same thing was reported also from the Great Barrier Reef. Because remember the El Nino cycle, which mm. comes around every 10 or 12 years, also leads to ocean temperatures warming and coral being bleached. And then everyone goes into a panic. But now we know from the Great Barrier Reef that over the past 50 years, the amount of coral has actually increased. Okay far from being in crisis. And that coral recovers after El Nino 
events. So a lot of these problems are per perceived in our minds because we've only been studying them for a relatively short period, a few decades. Mm. But when you look at the long term, I think there's hope. And we now know that we can build artificial reefs with some success by sinking wrecks or objects into the water. So I think coral reefs can be restored in the future. We've arguably we've lost a lot of diversity, but there, there is hope. At the same time, we need to remember that fisheries is a major part of Sri Lanka's economy. And we need to make sure that this is sustained because so many thousands or tens of thousands of people depend on fisheries for their livelihoods. So managing the fisheries stock effectively is something the fisheries ministry in Sri Lanka does pretty well. Okay. Everyone will complain, but I think they do a pretty good job. Right. Both the inland and marine fisheries are quite good in Sri Lanka. We can double them or treble them, sure. So not good enough, but they, they could have been a lot worse. And so I think we need to be grateful also for the successes that we've had in conservation. Mm. You know, Sri Lanka hasn't lost many species to extinction. I wanted to ask about some success stories as well, actually. If yeah. you can further elaborate on that. So I, I think we should be grateful that we haven't, that things aren't worse. In many countries, things are worse. Uh, we've had extinctions. Is it purely because that we are an island nation? Or? I don't know. It's very difficult to know what causes an extinction. Mm. So... There's a bird called the fairy bluebird that used to be found in Sri Lanka's wet zone forest 150 years ago. It was reported, it was drawn by artists at that time. No longer. It's gone. You still find it in the Western Ghats. Uh, there is the blue and, sorry, the black and orange uh, flycatcher, I think it's called. Okay. Another species that used to be here, sighted around Ratnapura in the 19th century. No longer. Mm. It's gone. But still found in India. Most prominently, the largest breed of cattle in the world, wild cattle, the Gawa. Mm. We know it was here in Sri Lanka because we have fossils from caves in like, uh, uh, Batadomalena, for example. Right. Kuruvita has got fossil uh, Gawa bones. There are many places in Sri Lanka named after the Gawa. Gawara Thanna, Gawara Pitiya, exactly. Gawara Vela, this kind of thing. So we know the Gawara was here, but unfortunately, it disappeared by about 1680, the last one went. Right. We don't know why, what caused it. We can speculate. So we need to think about the ethics of, should we be reintroducing these animals, at least in a captive environment? Mm. Mm. Because these are dangerous animals. They'll cause much more conflict than elephants are causing at the okay. moment. I'm not saying that we should release Gawa in Sri Lanka. This, this would be dangerous. So Gawa is a dangerous But animal. it's part of our landscape. It's part of our biodiversity heritage. Okay. And it should be in this country, in my view. Uh, and so we need to think about how we can restore species that have been lost. There are many species of amphibians. We can't restore them. They've gone maybe a dozen species at least we've lost. And there are many others on the brink of extinction, especially species of plants hmm. that we know. Dr. Himesh Jayasinghe has been exploring, fantastic explorer of plants in Sri Lanka. He's got a list of dozens of species that are known from just one location. If something happens at the location, a landslide, some encroachment, uh, I don't know, some, somebody doing something stupid by way of pollution, we lose that species from our heritage. And so to pay special attention to those is necessary. But I think we should be also grateful that we've trebled our population in the past 75 years, but not lost a lot more species than we have. Things could have been much worse. Okay. Uh, finally, I uh, would like to know uh, about this international... Uh, collaborations and the partnerships that can contribute towards conserving the biodiversity in Sri Lanka and what is the way forward? I'm not a great fan of international partnerships in in the multilateral sense of that word. Okay. So let me tell you the positive side first. There's a lot of room for bilateral partnerships. For example, if Harvard University wants to pair with Peradeniya University to do projects, fantastic. Mm. They know what they're doing. On the other hand, Sri Lanka has signed up to conventions which I think don't really work. CITES as a convention, the Convention on International Trade of yeah. uh, Endangered Species, is a valuable convention and we need to have it. But on the other hand, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which we signed up in 1992 mm. and promised to give us billions in green gold as a result of benefit sharing of genes to cure diseases and cancer mm. from our 
native biodiversity. Never happened. It hasn't happened just in Sri Lanka, hap not happened anywhere in Where the world. Else, yeah. So this is a big lie that was foisted on us by the West. And I'm, I'm grateful that the government didn't continue the lie by signing up to the protocols like the Nagoya Protocol, because this convention didn't live up to expectations. So I think on the bilateral field, I have my doubts because many of these conventions are designed in the West to serve Western interest and just put there as window dressing for mm -hmm. the South, for us to subscribe to. I don't, I don't, I'm not really a sold Fan on those. Of it, yeah. But I think bilateral re relationships, bilateral agreements to promote biodiversity research especially, hugely valuable. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohan Petiago, for joining with us to share your expertise and your overall view about uh, conserving efforts of the uh, biodiversity the ecosystems here in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. And we hope that you all got some idea about uh, the current status of biodiversity here in Sri Lanka. And we wish that the relevant authorities, including all uh, Sri Lankan citizens, would put their might into place so that we can uh, provide a better nation, a better country, a better biodiversity to the world. Thank you very much, everyone, joining us.